So uh, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit today about political risk, where we see things are going. I want to uh, thank uh, Professor Taylor. I thought that was an excellent presentation. I didn't know Belgium was so vulnerable, but now I know. <laughs> but you know, I think what's interesting about Belgium is a great example, right? If we were thinking about Belgium 20 years ago, how risky would Belgium be? Not very risky, right? I mean, it's pretty stable, right? Good chocolate, right? Good beer. Maybe the riskiest thing is after several beers, walking home through the streets of Brussels. But we've seen over really the last five or 10 years, we've seen it actually can be a relatively risky place. When we think about risk of government stability, not being able to form a government for years, and also the possibility there of terrorism, which has certainly crept up inside that society. And it kind of gives me a pause, because I was thinking, you know, where is it that we see stability around the world right now? And I was thinking, I was like, I don't really see it, All right? If we look at Russia, we look at sanctions, we look at Brazil, we have the impeachment and also future possible impeachment. We look at China, we see the formation of a new standing committee, a slowdown in economic growth. We look at the United States. I mean, when I was getting into this business a while ago, and I told people, I was like, I want to get into political risk. And they're like, well, what, what, what's your region? You have to have region, right? I was like, well, I want to study U.S. foreign policy and U.S. domestic policy. And people would be like, good luck getting a job, right? No one's going to hire you, right? There's no political risk there, right? Things are pretty much the same unless you're worried about Y2K, right? I'm like, okay, all right, thanks a lot. And you think to yourself, you're like, wow, look how things have changed. Look how we've moved in a direction now where really everywhere we look, there's a segment that we could say, wow, that is incredibly risky. And it's very easy to look at times in the past and say, you know what, you know, times were good back then. It was okay. No, there was risk back then as well, right, whether it be in the Balkans, certainly in Africa. But really, it's hard to imagine a time, at least in recent memory, we could see the risks that we currently face. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the risks we see as far as strongmen and also as far as authoritarianism and also uh, populism and one of our favorite populists, Donald Trump himself. Okay, so going ahead here, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, we'll touch on the Middle East, touch on cyber terrorism. A person on the panel here, Jane, is she's going to talk a little bit more in depth about cyber terrorism, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. We're certainly more than willing to talk about it afterwards and we'll talk a little bit about protest as well. Turning towards Donald Trump. Well, I think the first thing to realize about Donald Trump is Donald Trump runs for election 20 years ago. He doesn't get elected, right? What probably is occurring with Donald Trump is what we've seen really not only in the U.S., but in Eastern Europe, Central Europe, also seen in places in Africa. Just two days ago in Mongolia, first round elections, who wins? Populist candidate, right? And the reason for this has been pointed out before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Is there a laser here? Oh, it'd be so great if there's a laser. There is. Um, all right. These are the percentage of votes that have been won by populist party, the red line, a leftist, you might expect. Blue line, that's the right wing governments. These guys have almost quintupled or quadrupled in their vote totals within the last 40 years. The number of seats that they've had also more than tripled over time. And the reason for that is pretty evident is that as far as for the most part in the OECD, wages are pretty much stagnant, if they're growing at all. And then on top of that, what you find is that there's a sense that, I mean, let me see if I can go over here and, and talk, let's see, yeah, right here. If you look here, this is the, the top 1% in the U.S. society. It looks like there, there's overall wealth for them. And here's the bottom 50%, right? Pretty clear cut where things are going, and I think people are starting to realize it. So we see an increase there in the popularity of these parties, and then secondarily what we find is that there's a decrease in democracy. I studied in a guy named Francis Fukuyama, and Francis Fukuyama wrote a book called The End of History, right? Capitalism, democracy, they've got it won, we got it all figured out. Right? I was like, wow, I was writing it down, I was like, wow, this is fantastic, this is good stuff. Repeat this on the exam, got an A, right? Uh, that was wrong, right? He was wrong, I was wrong, right? What we've seen over the last 11 years is we've seen declines in democracy really across the board, 11 straight years, 2016, two to one ratio in declines for democracy. And what's interesting here is it's not just authoritarian men becoming stronger and stronger men or women. What we're finding is that it's democracy itself is beginning to weaken. So in other words, freedom of the press and access to elections in the democratic system by opposition parties. Again, part of the reason is economic Clear cut, off, really across the board. Part of the reason is people think to themselves, you know, do I have to choose between Mitt Romney or Barack Obama? Who's going to be a winner for me? 
Well, if you're in a situation you've lost your manufacturing job that paid you 25 bucks an hour, and now you work at Walmart paying 10, it's not a question of who's the winner for me, it's I've already lost. And so when you have a situation when someone comes to you and says, I have a simple message for you, and if you follow my message, and we can blame either the elites, right, from a leftist perspective, or from a right-wing perspective, we can blame the immigrants or someone else, right, it's a very easy message to sell. And unlike in the past, when you had to sell your message through a political party, nowadays how you can sell your message is you can, you can do a, a, twit, a tweet. Tweet. I'm always mispronouncing that. You can do a tweet, right? You can go on Facebook, right? You can go on social media. You can look at the five-star movement inside Italy and how that began pretty much as a political blog. And at this point, as we heard earlier, as far as recent polling, depends on whether it's, you know, I think some of that polling is starting to change. Biggest party in Italy. Political blog, biggest party in Italy. Donald Trump, an afterthought, a joke, most powerful person in the world. Okay? What are we seeing now is that so we have direct communication. We do see some differences between the lefts and the rights. Primarily in the rights, kick up against political opponents and kick down where the leftists pretty much kick up and they kick to the outside Western governments and, and multinational corporations. Talking about Donald Trump. There he is. This is making decision there. Look how serious he is. This is him uh, <laughs> deciding to, uh, to, to bomb Syria. All right? And we'll talk a little bit about the Middle East in a moment. won't to spend too much time on it. But what you're seeing here is a guy who comes into office and has absolutely no political experience whatsoever. He was never a dog catcher, didn't serve on a city council, to my knowledge, had no idea of how the system works. And so what that means is that you're learning on the job. And all U.S. presidents have to learn on the job, but he's had to learn probably more than most. And that's part of the reason why you see such a muddled message that's coming from this administration. Because I think in some ways, very easy to announce your policies when you're on the campaign trail, a lot harder when you're actually governing. How is he running the government? Well, he's running the government much like he ran his family business. We think of this Trump organization, all right, as his tens of thousands of employees, and that's, that's true, right? I mean, if you go to a casino, there's a lot of folks working around there, right? But if you look at the major investment decisions of that corporation, or that business, I should say, uh, over the last 20 years, it's really one person at the top, and then family members and friends that basically circle around him that make the big decisions, and then you have outside advisors that come and wave their hand and say, listen to me, listen to me, and the ones that are successful in getting their message across, they raise in his esteem, and those that seem to be losing money or seem to have discredited him, those get banished from the kingdom. And there's this constant churn within the organization. And that's exactly what we're seeing in policy. And that's the reason why you constantly have this feuding and the release of leaks within this administration. As each one of these groups that are outside family members and friends vie for his attention and try to diminish the power of their enemies. So that, we're going to talk a little bit about factions in a moment, but part of them is the generals, Bannon, which represents American first, the ideologues, and then Colin, which represents the globalists, or what some people call the Democrats. Talking about American foreign policy, this is where Donald Trump was when he did his campaign. Let me go over here. This is unilateralist right here, right? America, go ahead. Top gun, top dog, right? And also a very pessimistic view of the world, okay? So in other words, Everyone out there that's not from the United States, which many of you probably are, you're taking advantage of us. You're ripping us off, and we're sick and we're tired of it. We're sick and tired of you cheating us on trade deals and basically leaning on us for your own defense that you're unwilling to pay for. And you know what? Those days are over, right? And that was his campaign. And that's where he actually feels most comfortable. Where is he today? Well, he's up here. Well, he's here. Right? But who is it? all the people that he hired for his foreign policy team? Well, they're all realists. Right? That's balance of power. Right? That's Henry Kissinger. Uh, right? These are people here that look at things from a very much Republican hawkish position point. Yes, America's the strongest. Yes, we need to act on our foreign policy. Yes, we need to be strong. But it's not one that necessarily wants to completely upset the apple cart. So we've seen a division as far as the campaign and where Trump would like to naturally lead, but because he realizes he's not that comfortable knowing about the situation in Sudan or Somalia or Afghanistan or elsewhere, what he's done is he's relied on these individuals who primarily are generals or have intelligence experience to basically lead the way. 
And the advantage there is that these people have a lot of experience. The disadvantage is, is that when you have military minds leading foreign policy, of course, any time you face a problem, you have a military solution. So that could be positives and that could be negatives. But it does reflect on what he's viewing in the world. And so what we've seen is it's divided in that issues he doesn't know about, they take control. But when he gets involved, issues of Syria, you're killing the kids, right? Maybe even issues of North Korea, emotive issues, he comes back into the forefront and he lets this kind of American first mentality take control. Trade policy is a little bit different. We did hear, like, over, you know, during the, during the campaign, he's going to lead in direction, very protectionist, very, you know, radical as far as uh, kind of trade, overall trade policy. And if you look at the advisors, they're very much along that protectionism line here. Now, deregulation, every, all these, the Republicans are in blue. Probably should do them in red, but, all right, the, the, the Republicans are blue. They all agree on deregulation, but where the divide is is on trade. But this is where Donald Trump is. He's very much a protectionist. He believes in this. He's actually been writing about this since the 1980s. The problem is it's very difficult to enact these type of policies with all of the commitments the U.S. currently has. And so what he's doing is he's tiptoeing towards protectionism, especially as he's gotten more and more of these individuals confirmed by the Senate, and he can bring them aboard. So what we're seeing probably in the next few years is, yes, he's not going to be nearly as protectionist as we thought, but he's probably going to be more protectionist than a lot of people actually imagine. Uh, this again goes into the different factions. There are the generals. There are the globalists. Again, some people call these the Democrats, very much multilateral folks, as we can all work together now. Uh, and they're all vying for power. There's establishment. You can divide these between ideologues and those that are a little bit more like your traditional Northeast Republicans, and then these guys. And again, what these guys are doing is they're all vying for his control, because what he's doing, he's doing a thousand different things in his head, and remember, the vast majority of those things he doesn't care about, right? If you look at Hillary Clinton in her website in 2016, she had 30 different topics that she was concerned about. All of those were subdivided into three different components, 90 different issues on her page. Donald Trump, he had six, right? Two of those were immigration. Two of those were trade. So he had four, right? The most, but the vast majority of these issues, he's just not that involved. So this means this is you basically see the, the agreements here, where the splits are, security policy, trade policy, regulatory policy. These are in your things. You guys can check them out later. But it just gives you a side that this is kind of that warfare that's happening within this administration. And that's the reason why we can see things like Qatar, where we have one message coming out of the White House and a completely different message coming out of the State Department. Uh, turning over to Russia, right? Uh, war and peace, right? Uh, she always does this. This is always great. She always has different little posters she does. It's kind of cool. Uh, you know, the thing is, is that I think there was a lot of feeling that all of a sudden we were going to have this, you know, brothers coming together, right, finally, you know. Uh, and it didn't, it didn't happen, right, despite the efforts, most likely, of the Kremlin and also on members of the, the Trump team, right? It doesn't mean necessarily there was collusion involved, but certainly there were contacts. And the feeling there was is that how can we make this relationship work? And for Donald Trump, if you look at his writings over time, what you see with him and his view of Russia is not so much we can all work together, but we can work together on the big issues. And where Donald Trump thought he could see eye to eye with Vladimir Putin was issues of missile and defense control, also issues of the Middle East and defeating terrorism, and also kind of, you know, undermining some of the other regimes, specifically Europe, that he believed were taking advantage of the United States. So almost that trilateral diplomacy and utilizing it as, an, as a mechanism to get what he wanted for foreign policy. But that didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? It didn't happen because he ran into a buzzsaw called reality. And that reality was based on the U.S. Congress. The U.S. Congress has a very anti-Russian opinion. So does the U.S. media. So does the U.S. public at large. And when all of a sudden you had scandal after scandal after investigation after investigation, there was a realization that going down this road was going to be political suicide. And he kind of made things worse for himself when, of course, he fired the FBI director who was leading an investigation against him. So all of a sudden it became very difficult for him to go down a road which he would naturally want to go which is bettering ties with Russia so great powers can work together. What does that mean going forward? 
It means it's going to be very interesting. And a lot of it's going to depend on Russian domestic politics as well. The Russian election, presidential election happening in March next year. How is Vladimir Putin right, going to you know, basically prepare himself for this? And it's going to be a close election. We don't know who's going to win next year. <laughs> but we have an idea. We have a, we have a, we have a front runner. And uh, he hasn't announced. He might not run. But, uh, but nonetheless, uh, pretty, pretty clear he has a good chance. And part of the reason is because he's popular, but to maintain that popularity, it's not so much just in the regions. It's how does he do in St. Petersburg? How does he do in Moscow? Well, I think that's an important thing for the... Of course, part of the reason is, is that that's where the protests are emanating from. But also the idea of I want to be popular everywhere to the extent that I possibly can. But the problem is, is that if you look at these numbers down here, this is the amount of money that the government's spending in relation to overall GDP growth or, or decline. And we find it's relatively minor. Parliamentary elections last year, very, very minor. So we're not expecting, you know, to, to quote Donald Trump, who invented prime the pump, but we're not expecting a situation where he's going to be able to greatly enhance fiscal policy, which means that there's a greater chance we're going to see a little bit more mischief inside the near abroad for Russia. That includes the Baltics, military operations there, buzzing by uh, naval vessels inside the Baltics, around there. Also in the U.S., we've already seen definitely encounters. And also looking at eastern Ukraine as well and the possibility of greater instability there with the, the ultimate hope there to be undermine the regime in Kiev and have a much more friendly regime uh, put in place there. Also, what we're going to have to see is how are the atmospherics when they finally meet next month in Germany at the G20? Can Vladimir Putin bring something to Donald Trump to kind of undermine some of the critics that we're seeing at home? And I think that's going to be one of the big questions going forward. Switching over to China. Uh, you know, China is was, was interesting. We all thought it was going to just blow up, right? I mean, we didn't. We knew. We knew everything. But, but most people in the media. Um, now, uh, we thought things were going to get a little tense. We didn't think things were going to get that bad because we thought the economic imperatives of both of these countries would prevent them from going on from a full-scale tra full trade war. But what we didn't know is that, well, what exactly he'd approach it? Because if you listen to the campaign rhetoric, 45% tariff on all Chinese exports to the United States. 45%. Labeling China a currency manipulator on day one of his administration. And then three, preventing any Chinese access to those islands in the South China Sea. So basically instituting a blockade. And in some ways, if you look at a blockade, that's a declaration of war against China. How much of that has actually been done? These are the, the repercussions. China was going to sell all the treasuries and counter tariffs. They, I actually got all of the analysts to... These are all of the industries that were going to be affected. I was like, go out, figure it out, again, put it up there. How much of that was actually done? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Very little, very little. Why is that? Why is it that we saw very little in a response by Donald Trump against China, at least so far, so far yet? Well, one of the reasons is they helped out a bit with North Korea. And another reason was is that they were very proactive in engaging this administration. So, for example, number one, uh, we had... Uh, uh, Donald Trump did not call the Chinese president during the Chinese New Year. That had happened 13 years in a row. Didn't call him. The Chinese like, well, what's going on? Beijing's like, what? They invite Ivanka Trump to be the headliner at an event for the Chinese New Year at the Chinese embassy. Tiffany Trump, the forgotten Trump, uh, she gets invited to be the guest of honor at uh, New York Fashion Week for a major fashion designer, Chinese fashion designer. Uh, we look at trade, uh, trademark inf infringement disputes. Donald Trump had 41 trademark infringement disputes pending in China. They've been pending for over a decade. They have all been resolved, and all in favor of Donald Trump. It's amazing how the wheels of justice work, right? Circumstance. Same thing for Ivanka Trump. She had four trademark infringement disputes. They've all been resolved. They've all been resolved in her favor, OK? Time and time, Jack Ma goes, I actually worked with somebody who, who worked on this trip. Jack Ma, richest businessman, goes to, uh, goes to New York, meets him in Trump Tower. They asked him, well, what can we tell Donald Trump? He's like, well, promise him jobs. And so they're like, well, how many jobs should I promise him? He's like, promise him a million. So he's like, million jobs. We're going to have to bring a million jobs. And so they're very, very proactive in how they approach this. Here's a, here's a billboard uh, that Chinese businessmen took out in Times Square during Chinese New Year. Listen, Donald Trump, so glad that you've been inaugurated. You're going to be a great president. Can't wait to see how U.S. Sino ties develop under your administration. 
It's so very, very proactive, has basically turned things entirely on its head, right? When Donald Trump comes into office, we think relations with Russia, whoa, that's going to be, that's going to totally transform. They're going to actually be able to work these things out. China, exactly the reverse. And the Chinese government has been able to turn things on their head. Part of those are geopolitical concerns. They actually kind of fall together in that manner, but part of it is the Chinese themselves. Uh, here you go. I, I'm probably running late here, so I'm going to run quick. There's uh, President Xi. He does look happy. He's happy because he basically has gained control over the Chinese government apparatus. And how he's gained control is not only developing a cult of personality around himself, which probably helps, but also by filling key positions with members that he has. This is a standing committee here. They're actually literally standing. But the thing is, is that what you're finding is that he's able to build up this construct around himself because the Chinese government and the Chinese party itself wants to build this apparatus around him. Under the last two presidents, Zhang and Hu, they kind of were caretaker governments. And we saw rival centers of power, both in the military and the intelligence services, taking control, and also a really greater threat from really globalization and the internet. And there's a big fear there within the Chinese Communist Party that they weren't going to be able to keep control. So they wanted to have a hardliner in control to basically move these things forward. Really interesting to see what's going to happen when they reformulate the standing committee inside the autumn. Does he announce a deputy? At this point, he hasn't, right? Which means that there's a decent possibility he's going to run for a third term, and we're going to see this kind of Putin-type relationship develop inside China. No guarantee. At this point, actually, both sides of the scenario is that he, he steps back, but certainly he's kind of leading himself to a open that as a, as, as a possibility. Uh, quickly to the Middle East, and we can't trouble the whole world, I guess, Qatar situation. Baseline scenario for right, so Qatar right now, where this thing comes from, uh, you know, uh, blockade basically and, and stopping a, basically a, a blockade on the border for Qatar and Saudi Arabia and the UAE, uh, primarily due to the fact of supposed support by Qatar to terrorist groups really across the region. Now, where this emanates from is really the 1990s when the Qataris uh, basically, uh, the, the current emir threw out his dad, and so you have new emir, and, this, and the Saudis at that point never really receptive to actually transition in leadership, especially at the top. Uh, at least it, it's not controlled from the very top. And so at this point, there was actually talk of invasion at that time, but the continuation is that over time, the Saudis and the, and the Emiratis have really changed the way they view political Islam and its role within society. And so what happens is Qatar hasn't really made that transition. They want to be a key player. Of course, Al Jazeera uh, in its espousing of support for the Muslim Brotherhood and other elements that were anti-Saudi, at least up until 2008, uh, were very controversial within the Middle East. And so what's ended up occurring is this relationship has fractured over time. Recently, what's occurred is there was allegations that uh, you know, the king made certain uh, comments that were uh, anti-Islamic, and then on top of that, that the Qataris themselves were supporting protests inside Saudi itself. This led to kind of the counter-reaction. This is a good opportunity. Donald Trump basically gives his acquiescence to the deal, and then all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. So the question is, is that why is the U.S. really divided on this message? Well, it's very easy to understand if you understand Donald Trump. Donald Trump met with the king of Saudi Arabia while he was over there and all of these regional leaders. So he feels personally invested in this type of decision. However, if you look at the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State, they have prior existing relationships with Qatar, right? So, of course, they're not seeing eye to eye. And so then, again, there's that battle royale that's happening between the National Security Council and the White House and his various, uh, various agencies. What is the outcome for this? Well, we're looking for three different scenarios. Number one is baseline is the Qataris eventually are going to have to accede to some of these requests. The request that came out uh, just a few days ago, completely unacceptable, has to break all ties with Iran, Hamas, uh, Al Jazeera has to be shut down. I mean, just to save face, the Qataris are not going to be able to go down that road. However, there is kind of some room for negotiation. The problem is this is going to take several months to conclude. And if it does take several months to conclude, several different projects for the, uh, for the World Cup are going to probably have to get delayed because those submit uh, holdings that they currently have are probably going to only last for two to three months. Other individuals that are doing finance and business deals throughout the Gulf inside Qatar, they're also going to be influenced by this impasse. So that's resolution number one. Resolution two is there's a military invasion by Saudi Arabia into Qatar. Probably right now not going to happen. We're putting the uh, odds anywhere between 10 to 20 percent. The reason for that is that the Saudis themselves don't want to go down that road for a number of different reasons, but one of which is that they're actually going to utilize this situation 
as a remedy to kind of basically clean house and some of the radicals within their own country. So we expect that is probably a lesser scenario. Number three is, especially if you start to see sanctions by the United States on members of the Qatari elite, maybe not the royal family, but members of the Qatari elite and business elite, all of a sudden you could find yourself in a situation where there's a military coup or there's a coup within the family and all of a sudden the policy gets moderated. Uh, moving on to Iran really quickly, what we're seeing there is really it's back to the future. The Obama administration was really an anomaly when it came to Iran. Let's get together, we can work together, right? No more. What we are is we're back to where we were before, which is that really you have Republican hawks that are leading this administration in respect to Iran. So we expect higher sanctions really for human rights, terrorism issues, ballistic missiles, and this is going to be an, on, uh, an ongoing theme that you're going to see between these two sides as they continue to ratchet up the pressure against one another. The issue here is that over time, the nuclear deal, which we think is going to stand, at least for the time being, because it's neither one's interest to actually go down the road of breaking apart, is going to get undermined, especially as Tehran starts to realize that the benefits don't necessarily outweigh the cost over time. Really, one thing that's absolutely fascinating, I don't know if you guys have been following on the news, is the ongoing little war that's developing within Iran itself between the president and the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard, the military there, is they, is they really buy for control of the, uh, of the economy of that thing. We're actually seeing quotes in the press on a regular basis now of them blaming each other for the fractures within that society. At this point, we don't see any major violence breaking out, but certainly if you'd see some kind of black swan event within that society, these two groups are really going to go after each other. Uh, moving on really quickly, we'll finish up here. Uh, civil unrest in the United States, we've seen uh, increases. Now, this is month on month, so take these with a grain of sand. 800, 1,300% increase in the number of protests, also the number of the participants in those protests as well. Partly that's due to the nature of those protests. We are expecting protests to pick up over the summer, inside July, August, into September for a variety of different reasons. Most of these have been nonviolent for the most part, but they're increasingly in violent as we've seen. And primarily they do that fact that we're starting to see organized groups on both the left and fascist on the right that are utilizing these protests as an opportunity just to, just to punch each other. And they're going to continue to punch each other. And that will ask, at this point, we're seeing limited property damage. But over time, we're expecting that to increase and instances of arson to increase as well. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if the Black Lives Movement also gets involved in these type of uh, altercations. And finally, really, cyber terrorism, not going to spend a lot of time on it because we have somebody on the panel who's going to talk a little bit more in depth, has a lot more knowledge than I do. But generally, what we're seeing is just an increasing trend. It's no surprise over here. The market has increased from anywhere from about 2.5 billion. We have expectations by 2020, it's going to probably approach about 20 billion for the insurance market for cyber attacks. And primarily, the reason why this is occurring is it's really, we've seen a transformation in the cost of warfare, especially within cyber terrorism. Because the thing is, is that your defensive, you always think like World War I, it favored the, the, you know, the defense. You'd have the line and you'd sit there and you'd sit there for days on end. Especially World War II, you have Blitzkrieg, it always favored the offense. Cyber terrorism favors the offense. The cyber attack that took place yesterday, the, the software that was available to conduct that activity, to, I don't know if you guys saw this. Do you know how much it cost for them to acquire that software? $28. $28. You can buy that software. Now, they modified it. $28 to buy it on the, on the dark web. How much money did these businesses that got affected spend for their cyber defenses? Billions. So if you're able to do that type of damage for under 100 bucks, it pretty much a lot of bang for your buck, so to speak continuing to see these type of operations, one after other after another, until we really develop the technology to create better defenses. And at this point, we're nowhere close. This could also lead to physical attacks. We've seen physical attacks inside Germany, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and elsewhere. And part of the reason for that is that when it comes to state versus state cyber terrorism, the counter-reaction is pretty modest. Look what's happened in North Korea ever since they conducted their attack against Sony or the wanna cry attack, which probably emanated from North Korea. Pretty much nothing, right? Look what happened to Russia, stealing uh, basically emails of the DNC, Democrat National Committee, releasing those to the public, possibly upsetting that election. Some modest sanctions against some individuals. The costs have nowhere, uh, in, in any form or fashion, 
come anywhere close to the benefits that these societies have accrued. This is going to keep going until someone gets punched in the nose. And the question is, when he punches you in the nose, the cost of doing an operation, again, another offensive operation, it's 50 bucks. Right? It's, a, it's, it's 10 people in a room. So it's just going to continue to escalate over time. Uh, and again, uh, it's not only just computer mainframes, but it's also going to see uh, things of all the interconnectivity that we have with everything that we have. It's not just even your phone anymore. It's your toasters. Twitter was uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, basically, uh, oh, sorry, after 20 minutes, your brain starts to go. Uh, no, uh, Twitter was basically, basically thrown off its system for the better part of several hours because they were able to infect a toaster oven that was connected to a computer, right, that would then was connected to a Twitter, to one of the, the Twitter accounts inside their own operations. So it's as things continue to be enveloped inside the internet world, whether it be toaster ovens or cars or this or whatever, hackers are going to utilize this as an opportunity not only to cause mischief, not only to get their propaganda announced, but more importantly for also for profit and just the happiness of doing it. So this is a process that's going to continue and really look forward to how you guys see this going forward and also listening to the roundtable here as we discuss these issues as well. That's all I have. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it.